Is this the dagger? Oh! Illegal substitution. Too many men on the field. Saskatchewan. Gizmo has a block and the sideline. He has not stepped out. He may go all the way. He needs one block and he'll do it easily. Promise me I wouldn't do this. McDavid stops up. What a move. Shoots. Scores! Oh, it's the Outsiders. And it is our best of show. So we have to have crazy, wacky music, right, Robin? Now, how can you not have a little spring in your step after intro music like that? (laughs) <laughs> you're right. Where's the year gone? And for us, really, it wasn't a full year. It was only a half a year because of the COVID stuff. And my health wasn't very good through the opening part of the year 2020. But here we are moving into year 2021. So we thought we'd better take a look back at some of some of our favorite guests. We couldn't get to everybody. There are some notable people oh. we just could not get to. But these are some of our favorites. And we just thought it might be worthy of reviewing and giving people an opportunity to uh, listen to some of the work that we did this year as we get excited about what's coming up next year. Yeah. Bring on, bring on 2021. I think a lot of people could agree with that, but you know what, for having some time off last year, we really did have a a terrific lineup of guests. And like you say, uh, if we tried to get even 10 minutes of everybody on, we'd, we could do three best of shows if we wanted to. So, uh, yeah, it was nice uh, nice going through the stuff and seeing who made the grade. Yes, exactly. And I said, we just couldn't get to everybody. That's absolutely for sure. The Outsiders, by the way, is brought to you by the Macintosh Group at REMAX River City. This is podcast number 38. Wow. And this is our final one for 2020. This is going to run over two weeks. I have to thank the Macintosh Group for jumping on board and sponsoring. 2020 certainly a very interesting year for everybody. And it certainly brought new challenges to not only us, but to everyone. And also to those who are selling homes in the Metro Edmonton area. The McIntosh Group at REMAX River City. I don't think there's any denying they rose to the challenge. They took a look at the midway point of the year. And they were struggling like a lot of people. But instead of moan and whine and bitch and complain about it, they refocused. And they finished the year rather successfully. If you're looking to buy or sell a home... And maybe uh, you're an agent looking for some work. Give Brent and his team a call. It's really easy to reach them. The McIntosh Group at 780-464-0075. Or you can drop them an email. And uh, they are at, uh, let's see, mcintoshgroup.ca is the best way to get a hold of those guys. So a big tip of the cap for them jumping on board. Okay, let's, hey, by the way, in our intro, And we changed the intro, I don't know, maybe in October. There is Tim Dancy, and I just wanted to point this out. The call on Mm -hmm. Wayne Gretzky's 50th goal in 39 games was by our good friend Tim Dancy, who we lost this past year to cancer, multiple myeloma. And it's a bit of a salute. I put that in intentionally because I wanted to to basically salute, which was a great call. It was a historic moment. I have a feeling that's the one Wayne Gretzky record that will probably never be touched. But you never know. There's always a lot of great talent in the National Hockey League. But I just wanted to point out that Tim Dancy was one of the original voices of the Edmonton Oilers on what was then ITV. And, uh, you know, we talked to Tim Spellacy last year at this time, and we had some great stories about Tim. But I just wanted to point that out. So It's it's worth pointing out. Uh, Tim was a really good broadcaster, and he was a terrific guy. And... Uh, uh, one of those people that you, when you think about him, you miss him. Absolutely. And we're going to kick things off with the general manager of the Minnesota Wild, Bill Guerin, who joined us. Of course, we go way back with Billy to Edmonton Oiler days. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, you know, some guys you can you can look at the way they are off the ice and you think to yourself, well, this guy is going to be a scout. This guy is going to be a coach. This guy is going to be a GM. But Billy, what do you figure? You know what? I 
seldom have had more fun covering any single player in all my years on the beat than uh, Bill Guerin, who was half of the running mate team with uh, Doug Waite during their time here in Edmonton, also on uh, Long Island. Uh, Billy always had a sense of humor. I, I'm not so sure I ever saw him uh, becoming a front office type. I mean, he or, or a scout or anything. I mean, he made a ton of dough in his career. He had a terrific career. But I tell you what, here he is now after uh, – paying his dues in Pittsburgh in the front office there, GM of the Minnesota Wild. So we asked him about that journey and, you know, the steps along the way. You know, one of them was, uh, you know, some of the things he picked up from a, a guy like uh, uh, Jimmy Rutherford. So these guys always mold uh, the path you take, and uh, uh, we talked to uh, Billy about that. There are a number of people that uh, that really helped me along the way, and, and to be – uh, to be involved on a day-to-day basis with a guy like Jim was was uh, was fantastic. I mean, he opened uh, you know he opened everything up to me and gave me the great experience. He trusted me in, in the the role that I had for him, and um, even before that with Ray Shiro, it was the same. And being in player development, you get to kind of see a lot of different departments and and just worked with some great some great people, like you know. Tommy Fitzgerald and Jason Bottrell, Randy Sexton, um, all these guys that, you know, that have moved on and, and, and gotten the same roles that I have and, um, or had them before. And, and it, it was just, uh, it was just a great, a great place to, to sit and learn. Billy, at, at what point does it click in that you think when, you know, when your playing days are coming to an end that, you know, Hey, I want to be, I want to be in hockey ops. I want to do something with what I've learned over the years, you know, some guys, when the playing days are over, they walk away. Uh, that's right for them. Uh, you certainly could have, if you wanted to, at what point did it click in where you thought I could be a manager one day, I could be a front office guy one day. Well, you know what, to, to tell you the truth, like as my career kind of got, got, uh, uh, nearing the end, um, it, it's just a position that, that always kind of intrigued me. Um, but then there, you know, the, the draw for a player is, is usually well, a lot of it is to coaching because that's the close, that's as close as you get to the action, to the players, to, you know, being on the ice without actually being on the ice. So, um, that's why player, player development was such a great, uh, role for me because I got to see, I got some coaching experience in the minors. I got scouting experience. I, I saw how the managers, um, you know, handled things like meetings and draft preparation and uh, trade deadline stuff. I was involved in all that. Um, and it, it, it just kind of, it was, it was that manager position, the, the, you know, the, the, the task of being, uh, putting together your own team, seeing if your philosophies work, what, what you think is right. Does that work? And that's what drives me. And, and, um, to be honest with you, being out of hockey wasn't an option for me. It's just really? something that, yeah, I, I mean, hey, look, I'm a hockey player. And I'm not going to try to kid myself and go and, and try to get in real estate or try to do this. I'm a hockey player, and that's to the core, and I was going to be in the game no matter what. So it's a sanity break for the folks at home, too, not just you, I'm guessing. It's, 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 it, they got to be happy to see you go to work. Oh, for sure. Yeah. No, Kara could not have me at home. This is not, this is not, it was, uh, you know, I, I kind of came in part, part time and, um, yeah, she just kind of looked at me. She's like, you don't you have work this weekend? Aren't you supposed to be watching some games? <laughs> I'm like, no, no, no. I got the whole weekend, just you and me. And she's like, oh, great. Well, we're, we're happy that, that that worked out. Now, here's the the other question for you is that there's an easy part to your gig and there's a hard part to your gig. It, it, we all go through that. What are you finding is is effortless? And what are you finding that you, you, where you're thinking to yourself, wow, I got to I gotta work a little bit harder on this. Is there is there anything that you could think of off the top of your head? Not not effortless. I, I, I mean, this is a great job, but you have to you have to work extremely hard to keep it. Um, I, I guess the, the thing that I'm uh, really thankful for and, and lucky 
is is having a great group of people to work with. You know, Tom Curvers, uh, Chris O'Hearn, Matt Sells. You know, uh, now we have Judd Brackett and Chris Kelleher. All our scouts and our, our you know, like just everybody around me is a good person. I mean, Craig Leopold's a fantastic guy to work for. Um, and there, there are people over on the business side and we work together on a daily basis and it just, there, there's good people here and I'm, that's what I'm really thankful for. And it, they make it easy on me in that, in that respect, but there's always something going on. There's always a problem. There's always, uh, things to be fixed or managed or, um, and that's, that's the challenge of it. And that's what I love. You know, it's, it's interesting, Bill, uh, so many fans, well, around the league, I mean, you played for eight teams for crying out loud. A lot of people <laughs> saw you wear the jersey. You know, here in Edmonton, uh, strange thing. Matt T and Kevin Lowe used to always talk How about even when they were players in New York, hey, wouldn't it be great one day if we could get into this end of the game? And sure enough, they did. And in your time in Edmonton, you had Kevin Lowe as – a player at the end of the line, he didn't play much because of that ear condition he had. Then you had him as a coach. Then you had him as a GM. You had one guy in those three different roles before uh, you ended up leaving. Did you did you watch Kevin? Did you have your eyes and ears open uh, for the things that didn't involve just playing? Like he used to talk about picking things up by just being a player that served him well down the line. Yeah, absolutely. It is kind of funny because, yeah, Kevin and I sat next to each other in the locker room. So we were teammates. Then he was a coach. And then once he got his chance at GM, he traded me right away. <laughs> so, no, Kevin's such a such a good guy and a great great friend. And um, But, yeah, I did watch him. And I watched how, like, he – you know what? It was – like I said, the, the natural transition was into coaching – um, and then he just seemed built for the GM role, but also seeing what the other things that Kevin was doing, like in the, not just in the community, but on the business side, which really said like, okay, the GM's not just dealing with the hockey team. And it might be like that in some markets, but I didn't see it like that for him. And he was just, he, you know, and then he got into the president's role and everything was just, there was a lot to do. He was a busy guy. He wasn't sitting on his hands just trying to make trades. He was, uh, you know, extremely busy. And that's, I picked up on that and he worked, uh, he worked his butt up. Plus he also had a little bit of slats too, right? If I'm not mistaken. So what do you learn from a guy like Glenn Sather who had a pretty good track record with great players? A lot. You know what? And and slats is just the one thing that I really love about slats was his swagger and his confidence and, um, his ability to communicate and relate to the guys. But he was always one that would, if we were struggling and he could help us, he would give it to us straight. But then as a team, he would always give a, he would always give us confidence. You know, I, I remember when we were down to Colorado uh, in the playoffs that one year, we were down three to one and we had a team dinner the night before. Mm-hmm. Uh, game five and, and Slats just stood up and he says I don't know what the heck you guys are all worried about he goes you got him right where you want him he goes you know just like like playing his day you got him right where you want him don't worry we're going to go out and win tomorrow and then we're going to just keep tracking him down and we're going to we're going to be fine and we were all like oh yeah okay great yeah we're, we're good and uh, the, the other the other the other uh, thing I remember is he used to always he said, I used to always tell guys back in the day, if you can take Wayne Gretzky's job, I'll give it to you. Mm. Nobody ever could, but that's, that's the message to, you know, the group it's comp- it's competition. It's competitive. And if you can be better than somebody on that team, then do it, take their job. And those are two, two, uh, two things that I learned from, from slats. I mean, two of the many, but, um, just being around him a short time was, was awesome. Okay, there you go. Bill Guerin, who joined us on the podcast this year. Another guy we really wanted to track down, and we did this one early. In fact, it might have been the first one when we kind of regrouped a little bit, and that was Chris Cuthbert. Huge change in Chris Cuthbert's life. Obviously one of the most notable voices in sports on television in Canada. One of those guys who's a 
part of your, the soundtrack of your life, I guess, is probably the best way to put it. But for Chris, Robin, here's a guy who, uh, who wanted to do so hockey so much that he actually jumped networks. And it's kind of amazing, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, he is, uh, CC is the epitome of the two sport guy. And, uh, you know what? He's been at the top of both games. Exactly. So obviously we had to talk about this huge jump. You made a monstrous change network wise from TSN to Sportsnet inside this last year. I'd heard rumbles that that was coming a long time before that. And then it, I didn't think anything was going to happen. But you make you make a huge jump. Was that purely to get back doing hockey? It was. Uh, you know, I'm I'm near the end and uh, of my career, and and I guess when I got into the business, I I I thought, you know, my number one goal was to work on Hockey Night in Canada, and I guess it's kind of come full circle. So, uh, uh, you know, there were some rumblings a few years ago, and, and it almost happened, and it didn't, and. Uh, uh, that door was left uh, ajar, and uh, and uh, uh, on a on another opportunity, uh, we finally got back together and uh, excited about it. But obviously, mixed emotions because I was leaving a great place with great people, and uh, and leaving the Canadian Football League, which uh, meant a lot to me as well. We we really develop great friendships with people in the broadcast business. You were working with Ray Ferraro, and, and Robin and I were just talking during the break about the fact that, you know, you go from Ray, who's such a seasoned professional and has kind of, you know, he basically, as he even put it, came out of nowhere and learned and developed. And then you're working in Edmonton now on Sportsnet with Louis DeBrusque, who's another one of these up-and-coming guys who gets better with every broadcast. How was that whole experience? It, it was wonderful, and and you know part of the gut wrenching of leaving is 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 leaving partners like uh, Ray Ferraro and Glenn Suter and and so many more. Uh, you know, at one point I I counted uh, uh, in the last year I think I was well over sixty uh, color commentators. So you you do you do get to uh, match up with a lot of people and and there's almost nobody on the list of people that uh, I haven't enjoyed working with and, and relished the opportunity and got better because of, but then you have, you saddle up beside Louie and, and in the first period of the first game, it feels like we've been doing it for, for years. And uh, I was excited about the prospects of working with Louie before we started, but uh, I felt even better about it as soon as they dropped the puck, because uh, I, I just felt like the way we, the way we approach things, the way uh, we think about a broadcast, I think is similar, and uh, and it just to be was a terrific fit from the from the get go, and it, it got better as I uh, I got uh, even more used to uh, to him, and he got used to me, and my pregnant pauses that sometimes caused him to to walk on me a little bit, and he he'd kick himself around the block, and I'd say, Louis, that's not you, that's me. I I put you in a bad spot there, and. Uh, uh, I'll be better, but uh, you know he he from from minute one was uh, you could tell how hard he was trying, and he didn't have to try hard because he's uh, he's just uh, he's just very good at what he does. Chris, you t- you talked about getting near the end of your career. Um, I don't necessarily agree, but I don't do the hiring. I'm sure Vin Scully considers you a young man uh, in the, <laughs> in the broadcast game. But factoring that in, what else made it the right time? Because a guy at the top of his game, like you remain, has options out there. What made now uh, or a year ago the time to do it for you? Well, I did mention at the time you do a lot of reflection during, uh, during this quarantine or, or just this period of lying low, uh, which we're back into, I guess. But for months... Uh, I was watching old games, games like Patrick Waugh's final game as a Montreal Canadian that I called back in 95 or that Oiler Flames series in 91 that went seven games. And uh, um, you start thinking about, you know, how special those games were and are still. And uh, and, and there's the same with, with, uh, with the football games. I mean, they were replaying old games and uh, – 
they bring back great memories. I just felt like I'd done everything I could in the Canadian Football League. I'd I'd been involved in 25 Great Cup uh, broadcasts. Uh, I was well over 800 uh, games called, and I thought about you know it'd be cool to maybe be the first uh, football announcer to hit a thousand games. But uh, y- you know, I just thought there was more things not done left undone on the hockey side. And, and while I'm assessing that, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, if I don't move, I've got to wait six more years. And then I am officially old in, in my terms. I mean, I might not get another chance till I was 70. And so this window opened up and I thought this is, it's, it's now, or, or, or maybe it's not going to happen. So, uh, I just thought, uh, that was the best time to take advantage of, uh, of the opportunity and, and, uh, and kind of come full circle. We survived the bubble. You did in particular, because uh, how deep into the bubble were you in Edmonton? I was not, I was on the periphery of the bubble and I'm, I, I'm thankful for that. Uh, uh, maybe it wasn't a safe because listen, it, that's what, what they did in Edmonton, what they did in Toronto, what the NHL and the NHL players did. Uh, and all of the, other people on the periphery, but inside the bubble, that that record of of executing that without a positive test is 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 beyond phenomenal. It's it was beyond our wildest expectations, and uh, um, and so that was outstanding. We were on the outside. I I, I was on uh, I was on the fifth floor uh, for our broadcast at at. Uh, at the rink and then at, up to the seventh floor to get my water and coffee and, and my Nutella, which uh, was a big edge in Edmonton over Toronto for <laughs> sure. Um, uh, but anyway, it, they, they, they would just ask us a series of questions coming in and then take our temperature. And the temperature was always an adventure with me because I was never running hot, but I was often running very cold. They, they always had to do a second or third reading with me because for some reason I'm, I'm cold blooded and I was coming out at about 32 or 33 before they finally uh, got a proper reading, but uh, they were careful with us, more careful with the players inside and, and uh, they reaped the benefits for sure. Chris, I got to ask because people here at home hear the finished product, your call of the game, which is, I mean, that's the reason you're there. Was there an adjustment for you um, doing it without fans in the building without that atmosphere that gets everybody amped up. Um, you're there looking at a bunch of tarp seats and uh, uh, not very much else. So how does that affect your play by play? Well, I was worried about it, Robin. And, uh, and I thought I'm the kind of guy that I get amped up with the fans. I just love that emotion. And I, I caught myself Well, I'll, 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 I'll get to it a little bit later, but uh uh, it was my biggest fear, and that fear was uh, kind of put to rest almost immediately. Uh, I'm not sure how loud it was coming across your TV, but in my headset, I could crank up the EA Sports uh, yeah. soundtrack of, of crowd behind me, and it was almost easy to forget that you were in an empty rink because of the volume of noise in my headset. In fact, sometimes it was so loud, I couldn't hear pucks hitting crossbars. And, and, and we even laughed once or twice. We said, well, we didn't hear a whistle. And we're thinking, how the heck would people at home uh, understand why we couldn't hear a whistle in an empty rink? But uh, but that was the case. But that soundtrack they handled was, was really quite good. And even to the point where sometimes – while I was following the puck up the ice, there might have been something happened behind the play. And whoever was handling that audio had seen it and gave that crowd ooh or whatever. And I'd actually check back because you, you were reacting like you were reacting to a real crowd. So uh, um, they did a marvelous job with it, and uh, it made my job a lot easier. There you go. That's Chris Cuthbert from Sportsnet. See how it plays out if and when we get an NHL season underway. Another guy we like. We yeah. were we were on with Rod Peterson on his big show in Regina, and that would have been late November. And it was nice to I, – I always love going on Rod's show because we can have a lot of fun. And 
he dragged you on there with me, and so I had to shut up. I needed you to talk a little more than me this time. That's not easy for me to do, Robin. Well, I tell you what, Rod's an entertaining guy. You can sit and talk, you know what, not only football, but hockey with Rod uh, all day long, and uh, you're probably going to find out something you didn't know. The other thing, too, we really missed, you and I talked about this back in September, when we got to the Labor Day long weekend, that's when we really missed the fact that we did not have a Canadian Football League season because we yeah. were so accustomed to having that, uh, you know, those rivalries, the Edmonton, Calgary and Winnipeg and uh, obviously Saskatchewan. And we'll even go further east and talk about Toronto and Hamilton. But uh, when we tracked Rod down, we had to talk about one thing, and that was the fact that it was a tough, it was really a tough November not only for us as casual fans, but also for everybody, everybody in Regina. It's only appropriate we would have the star of the Rod Peterson show on, and that, of course, would be Rod Peterson from his luxurious home in beautiful downtown <laughs> Regina, where the Grey Cup should have been played yesterday. And I felt a little a little down about that. Rod, how did you feel? A lot of people felt down, Bryn, and I was on a lot of shows across the country. People were saying, what's Saskatchewan going through this like what, this week? What's it feel like? And all week, it was just any other week. Like you wouldn't have known there was supposed to be a Grey Cup. And then on Sunday, you saw a downpouring of emotion on social media with the crying face emoji and, you know, <laughs> photos of the best Grey Cup memories and so forth. But I would say round about Labor Day is when it hit home that there wasn't going to be a Grey Cup and there wasn't going to be a season. It was $100 million out of the economy is what it was going to be. So people just really didn't want to think about it because it's quite depressing. Like you can think about the whole Grey Cup part of all, and that would have been great too. It was supposed to be the coming out party for our stadium, right? Because most of the country haven't been here to see it. And now we got to wait another two years. So it was, it was not forlorn. It was depressing and, and anger for some people too. Well, you know, I've loved the Canadian football league for a long time. I mean, I wrote the hockey beat for a long time, but I love that game. I mean, I, I've been sitting there watching it since I want to say 1962 at Empire Stadium in Vancouver uh, when I was a four-year-old kid was my first game. I missed the game this year. I think we all did, but just having that Grey Cup game day come and go with nothing, you kind of, I, I didn't get depressed, but I kind of sat back and thought, holy cow, well, how do we get back to what we're used to? Because it's been a part of a lot of our lives for a long time. So how do we get back? We've got a schedule. I don't know how much it means, but Rod, what happens next? Well, it's uh, funny you say that because that was the title of my commentary today. So what now? <laughs> you know, because we got through that great cup and there was the memories. Guys, we had a Zoom call with the Football Reporters of Canada on Sunday morning. We, you guys probably been at it before, right? That Sunday yeah. morning brunch, always of great cup weekend. And that was the talk because to say, what do we do now? To me, is a little bit of a waste of time because it's not our job, Robin. It's the CFLs, yeah. and they haven't really asked for help. So I don't spend a lot of time. Like, I get it. Trust me. But, you know, they announced the schedule. You said all the things. You see all the public things that everybody else sees. The schedule's out. Hamilton unveiled their logo for next year's Grey Cup. But I've wanted a guarantee that we're going to play. And the commissioner won't give it. So I'm just kind of – that. what's next would be a nice guarantee that they're going to find a way to play without fans, and they're not willing to do that. So I don't want to be a bit of a downer here, but I think there's a difference between realism and negativity, and I want to be real. Are we playing next year or not, Robin? Like, we yeah. can't really plan until we know. It's funny. We, we chatted with Chris Cuthbert a few months ago, and one of the things that, that I expressed to Chris, and he kind of echoed it a little bit, was – I didn't like how they went into a radio silence mode through the entire summer. We didn't really know what was going on with the league. Everybody kept saying, are we going to have a season? Are we going to have a season? Nobody stepped up and said anything. They didn't keep us in the loop. And I'm not talking about media. Fans weren't kept in the loop. At least now they're at least saying something and maybe giving us a carrot on a stick, something to look forward to. But I would rather hear negative stuff than no stuff at all out of the Canadian Football League at this point. 
Yeah, but you guys have been in this a long time, as have I. The CFL, and the way sports is now, before you press record, we acknowledge how it's a different time. And the people running these teams and leagues, and let's be honest, broadcast outlets now, can't handle any negativity whatsoever. I think that's why the three of us are involved in this call right now. <laughs> you know, because we kind of come from the old school. And the CFL would rather say nothing than be criticized is my point. Yeah. And I think the commissioner, you know, good on him for coming out and saying, having a state of the league last week, Mm -hmm. but then the next, but he didn't say anything. So the next day he came on my show and I said, Randy, I was hoping you would say that we're going to play no matter what. And he's like, well, Rod, you know, you're a pro and you're looking a little deeper than most people. And we've got several options to play. And, I, well, I'm a fan just like anybody else. Guys, I buy season tickets. And, and by the way, do you know why I buy season tickets for the Pats and the Rush and the Riders? It's so that I don't, that I don't owe the team anything. Yeah. Not that, oh, we let you in the press box for free and we fed you, so you better be nice to us, which is what it's become. So sorry to go off on my tangent here. No, it's all but right. Anyways, yeah, well, they just they feel like um, – you know, they don't want the public glare. So my, my direction of my show today was, listen, I'm not going to be on the CFL's back all every day for months now that it's the technical off season. I'm, gonna, I'm doing hockey broadcasts. I'm covering the NFL. I'm going to move on because this is what you guys want. And there was a lot of fans writing into my show, a lot in it, from Edmonton, wanting to talk CFL. And I said, guys, I'm, I'm not going to be that guy sitting here all winter whining and pissing and moaning that there's no plan that that's, that's not my deal. So <laughs> that's my answer to that. Well, I mean, yeah, we've got to hear, we don't make the call. Uh, we react when the call is made and until that call is made, uh, you know, why sit here and what if, um, if only, um, it doesn't, it doesn't do any good. It has to come from the top. The teams have to get together and decide how it's going to be and what it's going to be. Uh, I don't think they can possibly, um, you know, I, I would hope not playing is, is, is not an option. Um, but I don't know. Give, give me a, they've given us a schedule, but that's not really worth the paper it's printed on, is it? Not to me. Like, <laughs> Most teams have their season tickets on sale. And the riders have unveiled the ticket package where you can actually buy season tickets for the next three years. They're calling it an MVP program. And there's a lot of perks in there. You can get a signed jersey by your favorite player. and There's a lot of cool stuff. But let's forget about the, the fans for a second and just think about sponsorship. Gentlemen, mm-hmm. if you own Griffith's Farm Machinery, are you buying an ad on the field? until you get a guarantee that there's a season, are you going to, Bryn? No, I, I've got other places to spend that machinery money. <laughs> well, <laughs> see what I'm saying? Like, yeah. it's, I don't want to say they're trying to trick people. That's what it looks like. Let me, go, let me flip this for a second. The NHL has guaranteed a season. They've said it many times. And it's like five weeks away, January 1st. We don't have a schedule yet. The WHL has guaranteed a season beginning January 8th. They don't have a schedule yet, (laughs) but they have a plan to play. CFL is completely opposite and backwards, if you will. We have a schedule. We're announcing our coaching staff. Okay, guarantee me that you're going to play then. Can't do that. There's Rod Peterson. Check out his show, The Rod Peterson Show. I'm sure you'll be entertained greatly. It's uh, always a lot of fun. He gets some great guests too, by the way. Hey, we had a chance Mm -hmm. to talk to Tara Sloan from Sportsnet. And Tara, Tara, because of where we're at, had to find some different work. And, uh, but she's still working with Sportsnet, but she found a a niche that, that has not been touched by Canadian broadcasters. And that is a specific program to highlight women's, uh, achievements in Canadian sport. I think it's a great idea. And uh, we had a lot of fun when we chatted with her. I, I, I'd worked with her before, actually, in Calgary years and years ago, but it was kind of a first-time interview for you, Robin. Well, you know, Tara's a very interesting person, interesting background as well uh, in the music industry, and 
you know, has come to television and with the top of her game is advocating for women in broadcasting, women in sports in general. Um, Really interesting story how she got to that. Can you tell everybody a little bit about top of her game and how this thing got started? Because you're telling some great stories. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I My kind of running joke at this point is it, it sort of took a pandemic to get a, a show about women in sport off the ground, which is kind of true. Um, but, you know, I, I think the, the pause in, in live sports uh, left space for a lot of us to think, okay, what are we missing? And Ron McLean and I have always been really intentional about including stories um, that, uh, that are representative of all Canadians at, during Rogers hometown hockey. And obviously that's one of the shows that, that got cut short. And so for me, women in sport is a, is a big passion for me. I've always been a pretty strong advocate. And so there was room for this to happen. And it's, it's pretty simple. It's just a, it's a weekly show where I do one sort of long form feature interview with an inspiring women, woman or girls. In, in the world of sport. And then we also show, do some, some features. Uh, I think we're going on our 16th or 17th week now, and we're just going to keep doing it until they tell us to stop because we know that there's no shortage of stories. Um, we just, we need to share them. And, and it's really important for youth out there to, to see that, that this is happening. So I feel really good about it. Tara, one of the things is, uh, I mean, it's a big picture, but one of the things is uh, women in sports media, mm-hmm. uh, getting getting uh, the faces out there that are part of the game, whether it's the National Hockey League, uh, CFL, NBA. Um, we've, we've had some women in this town uh, who, you know, been sort of leading edge a little bit. I mean, uh, Joanne Ireland for a long time was a, CFL writer here at the Edmonton Journal, covered the Oilers. Uh, Quinn Phillips, who's the daughter of Rod Phillips, the longtime mm-hmm. Oilers play-by-play man, uh, she's on uh, the sports desk here in town. But there's always room for more. And I'm surprised when you say it took a pandemic. Now, I know that's kind of tongue-in-cheek, but how come it's, how come it's taking so long? Ah, I, that's a good question. I think it's multifaceted. You know, I mean, I think it is a matter of being what you can be. So, I mean, I think the more um, our faces are and voices are out there, the more, you know, a young girl can, can grow up seeing that that's an opportunity, that's, that's a possibility for her. Um, but, I, you know, I do think that there has to be some intentionality about it. You know, I, I, the bottom line for me is, if you want to be inclusive, truly inclusive, if you want to be representative and tell the stories of all Canadians, you can't do that from just one perspective. So, you know, I think the onus is really on broadcasters and media in general to say, we want to include women's stories. And in order to include women's stories properly, women need to tell these stories. So, but You know, I'm not saying it has to be mandated, but I think there just has to be an understanding that if you really want the full spectrum, that's what you have to do. Now, we'll go back down that road and some of the other roads in a minute, but let's talk about you and how you got started in this. I remember I was working at Sports at 960, the fan in Calgary. You were at City TV. I think it was 2012 Mm -hmm. and the Olympics were on from London. And one week you were co-hosting with Pat Steinberg, and then you got stuck with me for a week. You were fantastic. You just blew me away. But you went from a show that you were doing, it was a crazy show, and you did all sorts of different topics. Did you always have this one thing that you wanted to do, and that was cover a lot of sports, and maybe from a different perspective, as you've pointed out? I, as soon as I got into TV, and, and people who know my career know that that's not where I started. I, I had a music career before that and sort of jumped into TV um, in the mid-2000s. But as soon as I got into television full-time, I started to steer myself towards sports. I was always drawn to it, and hockey in particular. Um, the It's funny to say now because it's such a bad word, but I was really drawn towards the, the culture of, of sports 
sport and hockey in particular, the camaraderie, the teamwork. Um, and so when I moved to Calgary and took the job at breakfast television, I was just, I was kind of just putting myself out there and saying like, okay, Kelly Kirsch, who's the uh, program director there. I would like to do something. What can I do? And and they happened to have this slot available to do some coverage for the Olympics. Um, I did some junior hockey when I was in Calgary. I did curling. I did bobsleigh. I kind of did whatever I could to get my foot in the door. And then I, you know, I think it's partially just great timing and, and good luck, but I had the relationships in place when uh, Sportsnet secured the NHL deal and announced that hometown hockey was going to be a thing. And Ron McLean was going to be at the helm. And I, I sent a, a note to the president of Sportsnet saying, I, I think this is a perfect marriage of storytelling and, and hockey for me. So, you know, I mean, sometimes you got to proclaim what it is you want. And I definitely did that. But I, I often found myself in the right place at the right time as well. Now, you talk about, uh, you know, you can knock on the door all you want. Uh, luckily, you've had the opportunity to walk through it. But one of the things it seems to me uh, that has to happen is you need women in the decision-making roles that when a bunch of eager, fresh faces, be they male or female, show up saying, I really want to be a, a broadcaster, that that women's perspective is there. But first, they have to start somewhere to get there. So mm -hmm. it's a chicken and egg kind of thing, isn't it, really? Yeah, I think it's what they call similarity bias, right? You kind of, like, the hiring practices end up being what um, people in the executive know. And again, I, I think, you know, I think it's starting to shift. And I, I do think it's starting, that is starting to be mandated. You know, it's like, okay, we, we cannot be so insular anymore. But, of course, the, the progress is, is slower than most of us want. And, you know, even when we do get in the door, there are just, there are things that, that we face, there are double standards that, that we face that, um, you know, our male colleagues do not necessarily have to deal with. So, you know, we, we gotta, we gotta push through some things, but uh, we're getting there. Okay. Let's even go further back and let's talk about music because music's played a huge part of your life. Like huge. Yeah. Well, I mean, music, quite honestly, is my first passion. Um, going way, way back, I actually was, I had my sights set on opera. So I started my opera, my musical, yeah, my musical drive was really in, in classical music. And then, you know, I kind of botched my first attempt at university and, uh, I ended up, I had worked at Sam, the record man, for those of you who remember all through high school. And, um, I loved rock music and I, I just, I ended up, you know, I moved to Toronto. Uh, I, looked in the back of a, a weekly paper and, and found an ad for a band looking for a, a lead singer, a woman. And I ended up joining a band called Joy Drop and we, we lucked out. We got a, we got a record deal in the States. We did a bunch of touring. We put out two albums. And so that was, uh, that was trial by fire too. I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, but it was, it was amazing. You know, we had some big songs and, some great experiences. And then I went on to do a show in 2005 called Rockstar in Excess, which was also quite a, a shock to the system, but that was a, a reality show to find the next lead singer of in Excess. Um, so, but honestly, that show was really what got me into TV because it did nothing for my music career, <laughs> but kind of got me into television. So you never know what's going to happen. There's Tara Sloan from Sportsnet. Another person we had an opportunity to track down was Ray Ferraro. We love talking to Ray. And it's funny because we always, I guess, going into those interviews, we think to ourselves, well, if we can get 20, 30 minutes out of Ray because he's such a busy guy, we'd be thrilled by that. But how many times have we, how many times have we gone way over 45 minutes because we're just shooting the shit with Ray? I think every time we talk to him, that works out. You know, I, I found that uh, – with our podcast, I found it we'd run each, into each other, you know, in the rink before a game, before an AHL game during the lockout in Hamilton. I remember sitting down in a dark hallway, a high turned into 30 minutes about talking hockey. So nothing uh, uh, new there. Uh, the thing we, the, the thing with Ray is, uh, we touched on, you know, if we can get back to uh, uh, playing hockey again, which everybody wants. 
you know, what about this all Canadian division? How does that look? We know what the teams will be. Uh, how and when do they play? Um, and also we touched on, you know, the off seasons that the, uh, you know, the Oilers and the, and the Flames and the Vancouver Canucks had. Where do the teams stack up in that Canadian division? Uh, uh, Ray uh, went deep into what he thinks the whole setup's going to look like. A lot of talk about an all-Canadian division, like a one-off, maybe just for one season. Yep. It sounds appealing. Do you think we'll get bored of seeing Toronto and Vancouver and Calgary so many times? I love seeing all the teams. That's just <clears throat> me. But for one year, I could live with that. You? Yeah, one year's, one year's great. Um, I... I think what's going to happen is while everybody's trumpeting how fantastic it is, they're going to realize that only four teams can make the playoffs and they're going to go, well, wait a minute. That's if everything goes well, there's going to be some teams because you're playing up against each other all the time that are, that are going to miss. And they're going to say, well, this Canadian division's not the way to go. I I'm excited for it. I, I we won't get bored watching it for one year. I mean, if you're, if you get to watch uh, Connor McDavid play Austin Matthews, seven times you're gonna go huh that's pretty good yeah you know I, i'll take that and so um i i would i would miss seeing all the teams i mean i i, I think i'm with like what you say Bryn. i mean i i remember as a kid and i so i go back to it's not about us so much it's about like what are these kids that hopefully are the future hook to the game what are they like i remember seeing the new york rangers play on hockey night in Canada and go, Whoa, I can't believe it. Well, now the kids have access to so much more, but when you saw a different building in a different place, that's, that's the hook. Like that's, you draw more people in. You're like, man, I've only read about, I don't know. I've, I've only read about Artemi Panarin and Oh my gosh, did you see him get five points last night? Yeah. Cause you get a chance to watch. Well, that'll go away in the Canadian division. Um, it will be competitive as all heck. I mean, Ottawa's behind the pack, of course, because of where they are in their rebuild. Um, but, uh, you know, everybody seems to be on this thing, rate the Canadian teams. And I don't know, they're, it's pretty hard to do. It's pretty hard to go one to six and, and have any real confidence that you've got them in the right order. You know, it's funny, Ray, when you, we talk about a Canadian division, if you're, if you're a real fossil, you remember when all the teams was six and, uh, <laughs> you know, but you know, I look at this group now and there's been changes. We're talking, you know, Markstrom and Calgary and, and all the teams have made some changes. It's, I don't know that it's a murderer's row, but there's not too much to choose between the top, the top five teams in a Canadian division, at least based no. on what we saw last season. No. And you, I mean, there's so many going to be so many unknowns. Um, I'll go back to that 48 game schedule of 95. You remember who won the cup in 95? This is another sign of getting old. No. The Devils. Oh, that's and right. so the Devils in a shortened season were the one team under Jacques Lemaire, who was just a brilliant tactician, who figured out the best way to play was to smother everybody. And by the time teams got on the page, they were way behind. And the Devils would just, they just crush you. But it, in a 48 game season, it was the right way to go. And so there's going to be a team that isn't good enough to play 82 games. That's going to play 48 really well. Like they look, I, I don't like Edmonton's goaltending, right? I'm not, I'm not, you know, I, it's not my favorite, but for 48 games, can they hold it together? Yeah, they can. Sure. They can. But for 82, I don't know. And I, you know, I know in Edmonton, that's a, a major talking point in particular with the focus in Alberta that, you know, they went and got one of the league's best in Jacob Markstrom. Now that contract's a little rich for me, Mm -hmm. but when I look at the goalies that have played for Calgary, uh, in the past six or seven years, they had to make a, they had to make a big move. They needed, they needed a horse. And I live in Vancouver, of course, and I've seen Jacob Markstrom grow and mature. And that guy is a hell of a goalie. Like Calgary is a, if they didn't add anybody else, they're a better team with oh, Jacob yeah. Markstrom. And then they add, you know, they add Tanov and then they added Calgary has done, in my opinion, a really good job of value buying around the fringes of their roster. They've, they've picked up some players that are, I think are going to quietly be effective for them. 
Ray, you, talk, you, you mentioned, you know, value signings, uh, not to make it too Edmonton centric here, mm-hmm. but I like the work Ken Holland did along those lines too. Um, you get a look, see contract, uh, with Tyson Berry for both sides, especially with cleft bomb out at that price. I think that's a great deal. Both sides have a look. Uh, um, I like tourists, uh, where they got him. I don't think he's finished. He did. I thought Ken Holland did some pretty good work on a budget. He did. And the budget is, you know, people can try and say, you know, Oh, worry about that in the future or, but you can't like, there's, there's a reason they ended up at Mike Smith for a million dollars because that frees up money going forward into next year. Um, if Koskinen flops or has a tough year, maybe you can buy him out for one year. That means you only pay him two years on the cap. But if you get into a goalie that's yeah. $4 million, it's now past Koskinen. Now you're at $8 million in goal. Well, you can't do that because you got $21 million tied up in the two big boys. Um, Nugent Hopkins needs a new deal. He's not getting cheaper. Uh, you know, you're, you're going to have to have, you know, Nurse is going to move into a pretty penny. Like all of a sudden you've got, like the reality is you've got an $81 million lid on this thing. And so Ken had to go out and shop for players that, that didn't cost a whole lot of money. And I watched Tyson Berry 25 times last year. I did 25 Leaf games. So I'm 10 feet from him most of the night. And he was in the wrong role in the wrong spot. And he started terribly and he never got on track. Uh, as a kid, Tyson's an 11 out of 10. Like he is a, he is a fantastic kid. When he is at his best, what you will see is not a defenseman that starts the breakout and follows the play up. He's in the rush. Like that puck goes to the, to the winger. Tyson will move it to the winger and his legs carry him in the middle of the rush. In Toronto, they didn't want him to play like that. He was always behind the play. He never had the puck. His strength is with the puck. I've known Kyle Turris since he was 15 years old. The key to Kyle is his pace a game. It didn't work in Nashville. He and Laviolette weren't just on the, not on the same page. They were on different, they were in a different book. Um, Tippett knows him. I think he can be behind, uh, behind the two big boys. He can be a really effective player for them. It gives them a, a, a position holder that they didn't have last year. Uh, Dominic Cahoon, he's good. He's a good player. Uh, didn't cost him much. I mean, you've got to, when you have so much money tied up in so few players, you've got a bargain shop. You have to hit with some of these guys. And that's what Ken hopes to do. I got to ask you about Vancouver because I got a lot of relatives on the West Coast and, and they were a little concerned because when you lose your goaltender, who I think kept them in a lot of games some nights, I don't even know where to start with Vancouver, but you're out there. Is it panic point, or are they happy with how this long, prolonged uh, situation is going on? Uh, just how do you see them stacking up? Well, they're they're unquestionably not as good as they were when they left the bubble. Okay. Um, uh, now Nate Schmidt uh, traded out for Chris Tanev. I can I can buy that. Okay. You know, like I like Nate Schmidt. Um, Braden Holtby for Jacob Markstrom, not as good. Um, their goaltending uh, will not be as good unless Thatcher Demko takes a huge step and or Holtby is able to recapture a little bit of, of what he was. He Look at his save percentage last year. Look at his high danger save percentage. And they're not at the, at the numbers they used to be. And some of that's age. Some of that's the way capitals play. And, um, but it's a reasonable facsimile. The, the Canucks are in a, are in a spot, uh, financially. Um, there's a debate out here. Like I, I would say the two, uh, most intense Twitter fan base, whatever is in Vancouver and Edmonton. Like, so there's people that say there is no cap crunch. Well, your cap crunch is you're paying Louis Erickson $6 million. You're paying mm-hmm. Jay Beagle. And Dominic Roussel, three or Dominic Roussel, Antoine Roussel, three million dollars each. You're paying Brandon Sutter five, just short of five million dollars. 
you have $20 million tied up in players that aren't going to give you anything. Yeah. So there is a cap crunch. Right. So uh, I think they're, this year will be, well, and they lost Tyler Toffoli, and, you know, their replacement in the top six for them is Jake Vertanen. Like, Jake's not a top six player. Mm-hmm. And he may grow into that. I don't know. He scored 15 goals last year, but there's just wild unpredictabilities to his game. The Canucks will, in my opinion, won't be as good this year. Um, they're a year away from some of their younger guys starting to take hold. They've got a real good one in Vasily Pitgolzin, uh, who will be over in a year. Um, they really like Nils Hoglander. is another good player for them. I, I don't know. I They did better than I thought they would do in the bubble. Um, however, they won one round. You know, it's not like they won three. And so there's there's a lot of work to do in Vancouver too, but I they've got some building blocks guys that are, you know, it's it's kind of like Edmonton in a sense. They've got building blocks that are, you know, that are unavoidable to look at as as real you know real foundational pieces. So there's Ray Ferraro. Obviously, we talked about the potential of a Canadian division, but so much has been up in the air at the time of our taping where we're at at this point. But it's uh, going to be fun to watch. But obviously, the the uh, National Hockey League want to get a season rolling as fast as they possibly can. One thing, you'll be able to catch it in English and French. But also, we had to talk to our friend Harna Ryan Singh from Hockey Night in Punjabi. Now, I, I've met Harna Ryan on a few occasions. He's got a book out. Great book. I've just started to dig into it now that i got a little more time on my hands. But... Uh, he he was a fun guy to chat with, but you know what? You don't lead into an interview with Harner Ryan unless you you play his highlight call. And I know that he had the big smile on his face and he laughed when he heard this. <laughs> Harner Ryan Singh is joining us from Hockey Night in Punjabi. How are you doing today? Doing well. Thanks for having me, guys. It's uh, it's great to so have it. it's great to have you with us. After so, that, <laughs> little smile on your face when that came up, huh? Well, I mean, uh, it's such a uh, it's such a once in a career moment, and um, you know, it, I smile because Nick Menino and I have this special bond. We've become good friends, and uh, we keep in touch and. He's going to have that for the rest of his career. I'll have that as well. And, and it's, it's amazing because um, something that happened 2016, the Stanley Cup final, and, and even to this very day, we receive a lot of love from that. And, and it's such a crazy cult hero following we have in Pittsburgh with Penguins fans about that. And then it resonated all around the hockey world. So it's pretty pretty cool experience. You have a book out and just perfect for this time of year. It's Christmas and everyone loves to get a great book. But this one talks about your complete story. That's something very special. Yeah, definitely. You know, I, I would think, um, you know, for myself, my family to be able to tell the story of uh, when my parents came to Canada and the struggles, the trials, tribulations, they had to go through my own childhood growing up in a small town um, and being able to tell the story that hockey was literally the icebreaker for me with my classmates and I and being so different with how I looked, um, the food we ate, the language we spoke, the music we listened to. Um, hockey was that connection for me and my classmates and I. And and so to be able to share that story, um, talk about some of the struggles with bullying, some of the you know, just trying to be comfortable in my own skin and how much hockey helped me. Uh, and then the story of Hockey Night Punjabi as well and how that show came to fruition, the impact. And and then, uh, yeah, there's there's so much to talk about just in terms of when we began this process for the book two to three years ago, uh, This the topics that are touched on in here about diversity and, and inclusion, about racism, about having representation in sports broadcasting, <laughs> the book became a lot more timely um, given everything going on in the world right now. Now, Harner Ryan, if I've got this right, you were born in Wetaskiwin, <laughs> but, raised, but raised in Brooks. And I heard you. I, I heard during an interview you talk about several things that I found fascinating. Um, one was a Northlands hockey stick that uh, was that symbol of all things Canadian hockey 
to you. And you also talked about that connection. Here's this kid uh, growing up in Brooks, doesn't look like a lot of the people he's going to school with, but there was that connection through the game. How important was that for a young man like yourself growing up in that kind of surroundings? So very much important. Uh, You know, I would say my entire experience growing up in Southern Alberta would have been completely and drastically different had it not been for hockey. Uh, Yeah, that Northlands Coliseum mini hockey stick was my first ever uh, present that I received, the first ever gift and toy. And uh, being born in uh, Wetaskiwin where cars cost less is a... uh, it is a fun connection I have to Edmonton and, and the Oilers. And then growing up in the eighties when Gretzky was winning all of his cups, um, such an, such an incredible time to grow up. And, uh, you know, even my, my kindergarten, uh, class picture, my grade one, uh, classroom picture, like I'm there where it's all, a, it's a class of predominantly Caucasian kids. There might be one other person of color. And then you have me with the turban and I'm the kid in the class picture wearing the hockey sweater. And, and you know, in, in 1988, when Gretzky got traded from um, the Oilers to the Kings, we, as a household, switched allegiances real quickly. And uh, in my kindergarten picture, I'm wearing an L.A. Kings sweater with Gretzky on the back. And um, I talk about that in the book uh, a lot in terms of how uh, much uh, Gretzky helped fuel the passion for hockey. But it's, it's an interesting... Um, storyline that, you know, here my, my parents were teaching me about our faith and our culture and our language and all these things. And one of the things I was being taught in our scriptures was to abandon your ego and to be a humble person. And here I saw the greatest player on earth, uh, breaking all sorts of Gordy Howe's, you know, records, winning all these cups, Art Ross trophies, you name it. But you know, he's always so simple when, uh, uh, he was always so humble when he was talking, um, and winning and, 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 you know, giving credit to his teammates and giving so much respect to, to Mr. Howe and, and giving his father Walter credit and everything. So I, I really, that also helped, you know, fuel that, um, kind of, uh, the attraction towards Gretzky. And, and, and so I think, you know, when I was, when I was at school, I became known as the hockey obsessed nut. I probably had the most extensive hockey card collection. Um, all of my assignments, my conversations at school were uh, about ho- hockey. And when I was playing ball hockey with my friends, it was, you know, I, be- I became known as uh, nicknamed Gretzky because everybody knew I was so just obsessed with him. And um, had it not been for that, I mean, I was the subject of so much curiosity uh, every single day answering questions about my turban. How long is it? How long is your hair? Why, you know, all these things. And, and it, like, had it not been for hockey, it probably would have a much more negative experience. I do get into the book about junior high and high school years about bullying and racism. And sometimes that I had, uh, but I would say in elementary school, especially uh, the obsession for hockey uh, really, really helped me. You've been doing this for a while now. Have you actually had a chance to talk to Wayne? Because sometimes that's that's a great opportunity to close a book on a small little chapter of your life. I was actually just uh, exchanging messages with him uh, just before we got on the on the air here because I'm I'm going to be sending him a copy of the book. Uh, as a fan, I was able to uh, get five authentic Gretzky autographs. My sister and I, and I touch on all of those stories in there. We went above and beyond, uh, even though we were in Brooks, Alberta, and my parents both being teachers, now retired, they let us somehow uh, take off days uh, from school and figured out a way for us to get to Calgary to uh, go to his practices. We were we were waiting out at the hotels he was staying at. And um, also his charity golf tournaments when he retired, um, I talk about a story here, the last ever game that Gretzky played in the NHL in Calgary as a New York Ranger. And, and it's at the Saddle Dome, enemy territory, you know, the, the vicious Battle of Alberta rivalry. But two and a half minutes left in the game, the entire crowd is standing ovation and chanting Gretzky. And my sister and I were brought to tears. Like, there's such, anytime we met him, even as a fan, he was just as advertised. Uh, so respectful, so humble. And then now as a broadcaster, I have had a chance to, to meet him. I filled in for Gene Principe hosting some Oilers games last season. And, and it was an Oilers road trip uh, in California. And I uh, had a chance to meet him there as well at the NHL 100 when we 
um, when the NHL celebrated a hundred years anniversary, I was eating, uh, at lunch at a restaurant in LA with my hockey night Punjabi colleagues and Grant Fuhrer was having lunch there. And we saw from the corner of our eye that Gretzky was there too. And we were trying to figure out, okay, do we go bother them or what? But lo and behold, Wayne Gretzky comes up to our own table to say hello. So that's just, that's just exactly the type of individual he is. He's so immensely popular, the biggest ambassador for the sport, but yet he's so down to earth. Well, that is such a cool story. And I, and I heard it. It's almost a, a full circle thing. You grow up like a lot of young boys did in this country and especially this province looking at Wayne Gretzky. Here's the greatest player who ever played the game. If I could only meet him. And then as you're into your broadcast career, Wayne Gretzky gets up and comes over to you uh, at the table. That had to feel uh, really special. I've got the picture actually right behind me up here. And, uh, and uh, you know, such a special moment. Um, Gretzky told me that his sons were fans of our goal calls for Hockey Night Punjabi, and they were often showing him some of our stuff. Uh, such a special moment. And, you know, there is it's so funny because – um, Ron McLean really likes to point this out, a good friend of mine and a mentor that I grew up such a hardcore uh, Gretzky fan. And, and uh, meanwhile, I'm in my career, the P- Pittsburgh Penguins, and it was Mario Lemieux who came onto the scene after Gretzky. And there was this, even though it wasn't like, you know, a geographical rivalry, there was this like, okay, Lemieux was almost the new kid on the block and him and Yager and they started winning their cups. And it was like, when I was a kid, I was, I didn't like that. And then, but here we go. And I, and I had a similar experience where Mario Lemieux came up to me in Pittsburgh with my colleagues and I, and when we were there for the Stanley cup championship parade in 2016, and he's like, okay, which one of you did the Benino call? I put up my hand. He not only pulled me in for a handshake, but gave me a hug and it was the, his words of like his heavenly words saying, you're a part of Pittsburgh Penguins history. You're a part of our family forever. And, it, you know, it was it's so surreal to have those types of moments uh, happen. And I'm sitting here in my mid thirties. I, I, I didn't ever think I'd write a book. I can't even, it's hard for me to even realize or comprehend that this much happened uh, to me in my, in my life so far. So uh, pr- I'm very grateful. There's Harna Ryan Singh from Hockey Night in Punjabi. Okay, the Masters, I don't, well, I've never said this before, and I hope I don't have to ever say it again. The Masters happened at Augusta in the month of November, rather than traditionally in April, which we're hoping for this year. That's the plan. But you and I know a guy who is a great sports writer, is retired now, and is spending a lot of time on the golf course himself, and that is Cam Cole. And he was a longtime writer with the Edmonton Journal. Moved on to the National Post. Am I right? Yes, you are. Yep. And uh, he's done some freelance writing. Uh, you know what? Has he ever done a book? I don't, I think, I don't know if he has, if he's written a book no. or not. He should. He's got plenty he of experience. Should, but, but, you know, yeah. some guys want and some guys don't want to. Right, but well, I think he he sort of stepped away from the old keyboard. Now he uh, he poured a lot of years and a lot of words into that keyboard, and uh, very few guys that I ever met uh, uh, wrote golf better than Cam did. He went down for that first Masters uh, when we flew in there together. I was doing spring training, um, and he came to do a couple of days of spring training in in Florida. And then he zipped off to the Masters, and the rest, shall we say, is history. He did it for like 25 straight years after that. Well, that's exactly where we picked it up with Cam Cole. It really is a special week just to watch it on television, but do you remember the first time that you went to Augusta National and what that was like? I do remember because I was down in uh, Jacksonville uh, for the end of spring training, and uh Drove up through Georgia and South Carolina and uh, ended up kind of writing a travelogue piece about the journey up through all these backwoods places to get to this gleaming, sunshiny oasis in the middle of a bunch of strip malls and, you know, not a very pretty town, but a very awesome golf course. And it was uh, it was quite an experience walking up uh 
from the press center just a few steps out to the edge of the number one fairway on a morning when not one spectator had yet set foot on the club uh, and just seeing how incredibly manicured everything was. It was like stepping into the Garden of Eden, I guess. It was just amazing. And I've never forgotten that. Every year that I went for 24 years after that, I I would walk out of that press center, out through some, uh, you know, a cart path and some some bushes and then out onto the first fairway. And I had the same chills and the same feeling every year that I went back. Now, Cam was, was your first, was your first year 93, the year we flew into Florida and you did a little bit of uh, uh, spring training with the Marlins before going to Augusta? Correct. Yeah. I, I, uh, it was 93 and that was the year Bernard Longer mm-hmm. uh, won. Uh, and you know, yeah, every year up until, and including 2016, I went after that. So that's a lot of, (laughs) I tell you what, that's a lot of bucket list stuff there, Cam. Um, you were obviously there for, uh, Mike Weir's win. Uh, you were there for, uh, Tiger's dominance of what, what was it four in six years or seven years before he, he got this last one in 19, um, to ask you for highlights would take a long time. But <laughs> when you think back to that, how about the, talk about the weir thing, just from the Canadian angle, that was huge back then, wasn't it? Well, it was in the middle of Tiger's prime and Phil Mickelson's prime. And so you know, from 91 to, and including 96, uh, only Tiger or Phil won the Masters, except, I'm sorry, 2001 to 2006, except the year that Mike Weir won. And so he won that thing in the middle of two great players' primes. And I think not a lot of people give him enough credit for what it took to do that uh, for a guy that doesn't hit the ball a mile on a course that really rewards the long hitters. So uh, just a, it was, it was a fantastic week, uh, not a great weather week, kind of a really lousy weather week as a matter of fact. And it was also the week that uh, Martha Burke had her protest uh, oh, yeah. over the old men's club and, uh, and all that. And so there was a lot to write about beside Mike's win but Mike's win uh, by itself was certainly one of the highlights of, uh, of the 66 or so major golf championships that I got to cover. That was a, that was a great week. Cam, that particular week, when did you start to think, hey, you know, this Mike Weir story is not only developing, we might have a real winner here. Well, Mike, has, Mike had had already a good season at that point. He'd won a couple of tournaments, and he'd, uh, you know, so he wasn't at a total outsider. I don't think many people gave him a chance on a, a wet and soggy Augusta course to uh, to stick with the big hitters. But uh, he started well, and he, he just kept making the putts. And I think uh, Mike has always been one of those streaky putters where if he got the putter going uh, – he was dangerous. And uh, so I don't think even up to the last day, uh, he was by any means a favorite, but uh, he had to complete one round uh, overnight sort of thing and clean it up the next morning. And then, you know, so it was kind of a long slog to, to get the job done, but boy, he made every putt that he looked at coming down the stretch, including some real testers, including I thought, the clutch putt of all time for him on 18, just to get into the playoff. And, uh, uh, you know, I would say maybe Sunday morning, it looked like Mike had himself a chance to do this thing. Not until then. It's interesting when you look at a guy like Weir, who, like you said, uh, got his win when there were some other dominant players there, you go to a guy uh, like Tiger, uh, who's back in it this year, as is Mike Weir, all these years later. Uh, Tiger was more, obviously, not telling you anything you don't know. Uh, he was the long guy. He was the athletic guy. Totally different player. Um, people always want to compare eras, and, you know, he's got the he's got the five green jackets now. But talk about 
those t- tiger years for lack of a, a better term. I'm trying to think of a, a more dominant, uh, golfer i haven't seen one because jack nicholas is a little too far back for even me but um has there been another stretch like that for anybody oh i think uh during jack's prime uh prime years it was a rare major when jack wasn't a contender and uh you know so jack's prime probably lasted longer strictly because he never got himself into a jackpot like tiger did in the middle of his career and Mm. had to come back from it um but i think uh jack's record of uh wins and second places and third places in majors if you go back over his uh timeline is just astounding how many he was there or thereabouts to win and uh so yeah i would say that the, the, the similarity between those two is that each was in his day, at least early in his day, much longer than almost anybody else. I mean, Jack was a big, big hitter at a time when, you know, they were still using persimmon wooden clubs and uh, mm-hmm. uh, Bolata golf balls. So, uh, you know, the distances that you look at are not the same, uh, but the, the margin that each player had over the others of Mm -hmm. his time was similar and uh and that's always been an advantage at augusta so jack's won six and tigers won five and phil's won three and you know some some pretty pretty big hitters there have have done very well at augusta yeah that's the thing i guess you know in many cases you know what you see and uh you're a little bit older than me not that much but i just don't remember seeing jack the record book tells me uh, everything i need to know and i don't think uh tiger pulls ahead in that greatest of all time argument because he's lost that time where it went off the rails for him and i i don't think he has enough time left to get it back but um those two dominant at the top uh, in their eras. Is there anybody out there right now, Cam, whether we're talking, you know, playing at Augusta coming up here or just in general that has a chance to put together any kind of stretch even resembling what we saw to those two? I mean, I don't know. Does, Does Dustin Johnson have any shot? Is there a name out there that has a chance that's young enough and good enough to be that good or almost? Well, I mean, the the key is young enough, right? Uh, for a, for a while, it looked like Jordan Spieth was going to be that guy. He finished second in his first Masters in 2014, won it in 2015, finished second in 2016. It looked like he was going to be there every time he teed it up there because he, he just seemed to love the golf course and it loved him back. And then disaster struck and uh, he hasn't been the same player since. So Augusta giveth and Augusta taketh away in terms of his career. I don't know that he's going to be able to resurrect things. Uh, the obvious names are guys like uh, Bryson DeChambeau. If he, if he is able to overpower this course, the new Bryson DeChambeau, the, the, the gorilla, yeah. if he's able to overpower this course this year or next year, and stays healthy. I don't know how the heck he's going to do it, swing him as hard as he does, but if he manages to keep his body working and discovers the the secret of unlocking Augusta, uh, he's got the length to do whatever he wants to with that golf course or almost any other golf course. Uh, he would be the guy that stands out to me as young enough and strong enough and long enough to get it done. There's other guys that are that are really really good players. Colin Morikawa, good young player. Uh, you know, Kepka, who's not maybe young enough at this point to go on a run like Tiger had, but he he seems to be immune to major championship nerves. He just goes out and plays mm-hmm. and and wins a lot. And so, you know, there's a few guys, but you. I really do believe that Nicholas was and Tiger was more than generational players. They were they were all time players, and I just don't see anybody doing the kinds of things that that they did uh, 
maybe it'll happen. Maybe there's there's more guys down the road, but I don't think we're in that era yet. There's Cam Cole, notable sports writer in Canada, now sitting back and chilling. Although I've noticed he's a lot more on Twitter lately. Have you noticed that? Seems to be picking up his game on Twitter. Anyway, Bob McKenzie, friend of the show. Love Bob. I've known Bob since he was with the Hockey News, and I'm sure you have too, Robin. Yeah. But finally decided that he wanted to do a little semi-retirement. And I laughed when I heard that. I'm thinking, oh, okay, semi-retirement. What, what does that mean? And, and Robin, uh, you had a chance to kind of ask him exactly that when we had him on the big show only a few months ago. I'm not buying the semi. What is semi retirement? You've had you you've been in the middle of the mix for a long, long time, and I know at some point you want to kick back and relax a little. But really, how much are you going to relax, or is, are you going to get pulled back in by this event, that project? Because you could be as busy as you want to be. Yeah, that's probably true, Robin. But I'll I'll tell you what. Um, I don't want to be too, too busy. And, th and that's why I, I made the point of quote unquote semi-retirement. You're right. What is semi-retirement? Here's what semi-retirement is for me, for starters. So as Bryn will know, because he used to be the host of the morning show on the radio show in Edmonton. Um, I do my, my old life was Montreal Radio, Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning. Edmonton Radio, Monday and Friday. <clears throat> Excuse me. Winnipeg Radio, Monday and Friday morning. Um, Vancouver Radio, Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, TSN Radio Toronto, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, Sirius XM, um, every Friday afternoon. Uh, TSN Radio Ottawa, every single Ottawa Senator pregame show. For, for every preseason, regular season, and playoff game. That's when the Sens were still making the playoffs. So all that radio is gone. And that's, for starters, that's, that's a lot of free time back. And what it also allows you to do is if there's a regular season hockey, if it were, if it were normal times, not pandemic times, if there was a regular season hockey game on, on a Tuesday night, I wouldn't feel obliged to necessarily watch it. I didn't want to because I had to know what the hell was going on for my Montreal radio hit on Wednesday morning. Um, yeah. So, you know, even during the, the playoffs, and again, it was summer, so it was a little bit different, but I was semi-retired, so I watched some games here and there, but I got to be honest with you, I wasn't watching every game. And now the stuff that I do have to do, World Juniors, Draft Rankings, Pay deadline day, free agent day. There's a start time and there's a finish time, and I know what those start times and finish times are. So, to your point, Robin, I'm not getting sucked back into the vortex of every waking moment of the day or every night. I'm sitting there saying, "Well, I got to watch every game that's available to me. Otherwise, how am I going to talk about all these games on the radio in the morning?" Yeah. So, so how tough was it during the bubble? Because I had the option of going out and mowing the lawn or sitting on the deck or watching a hockey game because hockey was going on in August. That was, that was tough for me. Was it tough for you? Uh, yes and no. Um, but, you know, I, just, I love hockey. Like, you know, and, I, and I love the career that I've had because of hockey. And I'm blessed and really fortunate. Um, but I've always felt like I feel like there's more to me than just what I did for a job and profession. And and it is my passion and it always has been. Um, but I'll be honest with you. Um, I miss junior hockey more than the NHL right now because my son's the general manager and head coach of the Kitchener Rangers in the OHL. And I get to be a passionate hockey fan of the Kitchener Rangers and my son and they're not playing, and there's no games, and haven't they haven't had any games since last March? Um, so I miss that more than I miss NHL regular season games. And and because it was August, August and September, as I said, I watched some of the games that interested me. If I was in the mood to be interested, 
And a lot of the other times I was, I was doing other stuff. Bob, you mentioned the OHL, and before we get into the book and the bigger picture stuff, got to get your thoughts on this. Uh, the OHL and no hitting. Uh, in a year when everything's goofy, um, is, is, this, is this doable in a, in a year the OHL is going to host the Memorial Cup? And is it doable? Can you play hockey at that level with no hitting? Well, here, here's the thing, Robin. The, the whole controversy and the fact that this has become somewhat of a cause for lev for me, it's simply because Lisa McLeod, the, the Minister of Heritage, Culture, and, and Sport in Ontario, on a couple of public occasions, very publicly, demonstrably, and assertively, made that point that, that if there's going to be a OHL hockey this year, there's not going to be any body contact. And, and so I was like, oh, that's ridiculous. And the reason I say that's ridiculous is not because I don't think we should do things safely. But, and I, and I, and, and when, when this, like on Friday, for, I think it was Friday, yeah, Friday, this past Friday, Lisa McLeod tweeted some stuff about it again. She'd done it yeah. a few weeks or a month ago, and I and I ignored it at the time. And I thought to myself, "That sounds ridiculous to me," because I'm not a doctor, I'm not a health expert, but someone's going to need to explain to me how "quote unquote" body checking is more dangerous to read the spread of COVID than the battle for a puck, which is you know, just an essential quality of the game of hockey, even non-contact hockey. Close quarters, battling for a puck or in front of the net. If someone's going to need to explain to me why, quote-unquote, body checking is inherently more dangerous for the spread of COVID than these 18 skaters and one backup goalie sitting on the same bench, breathing the same air after they're snorting and spitting and doing everything that hockey players do when they come off the ice or they're not going to be wearing masks and they don't have, you know, full facial protection. So, you know, I never understood why, why this was the case. And I asked these questions of Lisa McLeod on Twitter on Friday night and she didn't answer them. Um, and so it became a, and I just didn't understand why in, in, in you know, the OHL is not playing if they play because everything's got an if attached to it these days. Mm -hmm. The OHL is not playing any games until February. Um, why are we getting into this huge viral debate about whether there's going to be body checking or not? Let's take a step back here. But it was because Lisa McLeod kept on putting it out there that this was going to be the case. And you got a lot of hockey people really enraged, and there was a lot of blowback. And on Saturday night, I believe, Premier of Ontario, Doug Ford, tweeted out, hey, we're working, we're engaged with the OHL on a safe return to play, and it's our desire that when they start to play, that there will be body checking. But, as I said, everything's got to be done safely, and, and you know, and as I said, somebody's going to have to explain to me why body checking in the OHL would be more dangerous than what information did Lisa McLeod have that British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, um, Quebec, all the maritime provinces have that, 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 um, that, that they, they, they don't have because yeah. there's hockey being played at various levels with contact in all those places. You know, the BC Junior League is, is up and going and, and what have you. So anyways, it's um, I think it got more attention than it probably deserved because I don't ever think it was necessarily as cut and dried as Lisa McLeod was making it out to be. And the tweet from her boss, Doug Ford, on Saturday night would suggest that to be the case. Right. But stay tuned, I guess. Hey, how did you feel about the way the NHL handled the bubble and the way things played out? Because I, did we even have a positive? Did we have one positive no. test? I don't think we had a single one, did we? <clears throat> no positive test at all. Um. And uh, it was, I thought it was really, really, really well done. And I think the NHL 
He takes a lot of heat for a lot of things over the years, um, and rightfully so sometimes. I thought the NHL did a great job. I thought the NHL Players Association did a great job. I think the players did a great job, the coaches, the managers, all the personnel. Um, the, the people associated with the bubble in Edmonton, the people associated with the bubble in Toronto. And, I mean, hey, it wasn't cheap. I, it was, I think I saw them, uh, the numbers they were throwing out, $90 million. Mm-hmm. It cost the league to put that on. Yeah, That's a lot of money. Um, and um, but it, you know it was it was good that they could do it safely and um, it was and I think it was important on a couple of levels business wise they wanted to make sure that they didn't have to have huge refunds to all the television partners so they satisfied that um, but I think too they just didn't want it to be an unfinished season with no Stanley Cup presented and they didn't want. COVID to, to beat the Stanley Cup. There you go, Bob McKenzie from TSN. I still like to think of him as a hockey insider. All he's got to do is pick up the phone and make one call. He can get an answer to pretty much anything. Hey, you know, everybody's getting pretty pumped up about Seattle and the Kraken coming on board. Now, granted, they're going to have to wait for the NHL to get one season out of their way, but we decided to track down Todd Humphrey, who is the senior VP of digital and fan experience for the Kraken. And uh, Todd's a guy from Toronto. And, Robin, you didn't know very much about him. I've met him on numerous occasions, most notably at Grey Cups. He's a very good friend of Jamie Campbell's. And so the conversations I had with him are off the record on Grey Cup weekends. One, because there's <laughs> too much sensitive stuff. And two, I can't remember any of them. But uh, but his his background, when I said to you the, the background on Todd, you were fascinated by what? What was the one thing you brought up? Well, when I looked him up, the first thing I saw were, were YouTube clips of uh, Todd Humphrey beating the crap out of people or having the crap beaten out of him yeah. as a tough guy in the uh, minor leagues. And one year he was second in the entire, uh, was it the United Hockey League or the old Colonial Hockey League in penalty minutes. You don't get to do that by accident. I mean, we were talking... 375 PIMS or something. How do you get from there to there to uh, to where he is now? Did I mean you got to be a pretty sh- sharp guy, and uh, clearly uh, he is. Well, the other thing too, we didn't focus on specifics with the Kraken for the upcoming season when they're coming online, because we're going to have them on again at another point. But we decided to go down that road that you were talking about, and that is. Uh, Tell us a little bit about yourself, and let's go back way further than that. We we, we are anxious. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. But you, you're right. We are. We've been counting the originally the seasons, and now we're actually counting the weeks. So excited to get the 2021 season uh, up and and in our view out of the way, so we can drop the puck here in Seattle. You know, Todd, I'm looking at your story, what's ahead is certainly going to be exciting. Uh, everything that happens in Seattle from now until the puck actually drops. But the one thing I got a good laugh out of was I was looking through the hockey leagues you played in, yeah, which probably turn out far more uh, teachers, lawyers, and garbage men than they do uh, National Hockey League players. And here's here's Todd Humphrey with, 357 penalty minutes with the Flint Generals, more penalty minutes than noted goon uh, Mel Angelstead one year, and uh, guys who are in senior VP of digital and tech jobs like yours are generally pretty <coughs> sharp. So take me from dropping the gloves uh, as a as you know from goon to Tech dynamo, as it were. Oh, Robin, but, but you're you're not reading the whole stat sheet because that year was also my most productive year with 35 <laughs> goals and 70 <laughs> points. So I got to get that in because other my my mom is going to uh, going to hate on you for it. Um, listen, it's uh, I love that you you brought up Mel. We played against each other for three, maybe four years. I mean, they don't make them much more tough than uh, than that guy, and we uh, we're still in touch to this day. The nice thing about the hockey world, as we all know, is it's a it's a small one. So a lot of the guys that I have either punched in the face or been punched in the face by 
uh, you know, we're still in touch and uh, we, we share some laughs today, but that was a hell of a season. It was actually my last full season. I was coming off of, uh, coming off of back surgery and I, um, I, I worked our, my way back into the lineup and, uh, and ended up on a phenomenal line. My right winger was Kevin Kerr, one of the most prolific goal scorers in, the, in minor league history. I think he was in the Hall of Fame as the, as the most prolific until recently. Uh, and our centerman, first name was Brian, and his last name Sackick, uh-huh. um, Joe's brother. So, you know, I remember one of my first practices with Sack, and he just said, listen, I don't go into the corners. All you need to do is go to the net and put your stick on the ice. So of my, uh, you know, I like to say of my 35 goals, they probably traveled a, gr- a grand total of about 10 feet. Um, but it was, listen, those were amazing leagues to play in and amazing teams and teammates. And um, it was not the NHL, but at the same time, you know, we got to live our dream in a different way. Uh, we didn't fly on chartered planes. We got to uh, ride buses from uh, Muskegon to Quad Cities to uh, U- Utica, New York. Um, and Thunder Bay, Ontario, speaking of Mel Engelstad, but uh, great times and memories. And, um, you know, it was, uh, it was a great time in my life. Now, Todd, I, I saw a clip about you, and you went over uh, to England briefly and played there. <laughs> so tell me, did you, did you uh, spend more time in your apartment there or in the bar below your apartment during that time you spent in Britain? Oh, you're talking about Flanagan's Pub. So we pull, so we pull, we land over there, and, and our, our host picks us up, and he says, "Do you, you know, do you want to go out for a beer first, or do you want to go to your your flat and uh, and get a shower?" And uh, my buddy Dan Fowler and I said, "Well, we, we probably shower after a long flight over the pond." So, anyways, he drives through town, and he pulls up in front of this place called Flanagan's Pub, and we said, "Actually, we'd really prefer to just grab a shower before the beer." And, he says, oh, no, boys, you're living right up there, right over top of Flanagan's Pub. Um, <laughs> this place was amazing. It was the kind of the center point in town. Um, it was the bar to go to. And on uh, on Monday night, uh, randomly, it turned into a gentleman's club. Um, and there was, uh, you know, I won't go into many details, but it, <laughs> it was an amazing place. We had a dumb waiter that went from behind the bar right directly up into our living room. Uh, so, you know, we'd send down happy hour, send down a note that said, you know, send up four pints, and lo and behold, four point, pints would appear in our living room. So it was a fantastic experience The people in England. We were, you know, we're four hours north of London, um, and we got to see a lot of the countryside just, you know, on off days and whatnot, and we loved it over there. The hockey was, was interesting, to say the least, but I uh, just had a wonderful experience there. But yeah, to answer your question, it'll go unanswered. I'm not telling you where I spend more time. No, that's okay. <laughs> but there was a fan experience involved, so no doubt about that. But hey, let, let's uh, let's talk about one before we talk about the Kraken. Let's talk about how you got to this position with the Seattle Kraken. How did this come about? You know, when I left the game in uh, in '95, which is all of a sudden, uh, you know, a quarter of a century ago, um, I moved to Seattle in uh, in 2000. Um, and I was in the tech industry. I spent, uh, you know, the last uh, 18, 19 years in the, in the tech industry and um, have just been part of a couple of really, you know, unique companies and, and a couple of Canadian-based companies I'm super proud of. Kobo, which is a, you know, an e-reading company. We built that and sold it in 2012. Founded another, um, another company with my business partner, Mike Serbinas and others uh, called League, which is a health benefits company. So, I've always been in, in the, um, in the tech space, but really what I enjoyed about it was building. Um, and so we built tech companies in different industries and grew those teams and those companies. And, um, in 2016, you know, in, I never left Seattle, but in 2016, a, a friend in the mayor's, uh, office here asked me if I would be the hockey representative on a committee for the mayor of Seattle, former mayor Murray. Um, to evaluate two um, proposals to redo Key Arena, which is where the, the Sonics played and the Thunderbirds ultimately played a while back. And um, it was a great committee. It was full of, you know, different community uh, folks and leaders, um, you know, restaurateurs and, and other folks and, and business leaders. Um, I was the hockey representative, and a gentleman by the name of Lenny Wilkins was the basketball representative. Canadians will know him from his time with the Raptors. 
And I remember saying to Lenny, our very last meeting, I said, Lenny, you may be in the Hall of Fame, but I'm going to get a team before you are, man. And uh, so we, we spent a bunch of time evaluating, you know, the, the proposals to redo the arena. Um, we selected the one from the Oakview group. Um, I started working kind of behind the scenes with, with Tim Lywicki and his team um, at OVG. Through that, um, made some introductions on our ownership group. Um, and then started, got introduced to Todd Lywicki. And listen, when you meet the Lywicki brothers, uh, there is nothing about those guys that you don't want to run through a wall for. Um, and I just, uh, Todd and I was running, I was a CEO of a software company here. Um, Todd and I had breakfast and I said, listen, I don't know what the role is. I don't know if, what you're going to pay me. Um, but I have got to come work for this team because there's no way an NHL hockey team is coming to Seattle that I'm not going to be involved with. So, it's been a, it's been a journey to get back into the game, but you know I think what I love about it is you know I've um, I've got a big part of the, the tech experience here, the fan experience here. Um, it's a startup, you know I called it last week in an interview the nirvana of all startups because um, we are from ground zero to an NHL team in a billion dollar arena, and for me as a Canadian as a hockey guy, it's a hockey team, right? And so this, for me, is the trifecta beyond all, and it's uh, it's been a great experience, you know, being part of it from, you know, I think I was employee number 10 or something, and, you know, now just birthing this team, and I was in the room at the Board of Governors meeting at Sea Island, Georgia, two years ago, when Commissioner Bettman uh, provided us the announcement of, of getting the team, and it's just been an amazing ride, and it's, uh, it's just beginning. So I'm curious, when did the transition for you uh – begin in other words hockey at least playing it isn't going to be my future as a as a career and a job and how do you make there's a lot of guys who go get a real job so to speak yeah. but tech is pretty uh specific uh how do you make the when did you realize it was going to have to be something else for a career and how did you make that uh, transition it's a great point and um you know, I've got a lot of a lot of my ex teammates that have gone on to do really interesting things. My my transition actually started much before this, um, and my transition out of hockey started while I was probably ten years. Um, you know, I was probably fourteen, fifteen, and all I wanted to do was play hockey. And my mom said to me, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, you're going to stick in school. You're going to get grades. You're going to go to college, and you're going to have a future after the game. You can go and." excel as you can in this game, but you're going to, you're going to provide and you're going to have a runway following the game. And so, you know, all the way through, I've been a really curious person, you know, all the way through, you know, thinking about businesses and other things. So even while I was playing, I was always thinking about kind of the what's next, but it started with that statement to my mom of like, putting the hammer down, like you are going to think about life after. Um, But I've been, you know, I've been surrounded by, entrepreneurs my whole life, my, my dad, my stepmom, um, my uncles, um, you know, my best friend who actually gave me my very first job. I'll get to that in a minute, but all of them were always building things. And I always had this curiosity around how do you build companies? How do you build products? How do you, how do you grow something that's not just 25 guys in the dressing room? And, um, you know, my, I'm not a techie in, in terms of I'm not writing code, but I've, I've been able to leverage a lot of other smart people and, and build ideas around how do we use technology to make things better in our world. So there's Todd Humphrey, who is with the Kraken in Seattle, kind of giving us the lowdown on him. Like I said, I, I'm excited. That's going to be fun when they come on board. Uh, you know, everybody's been talking about this all-Canadian division. I, it, that, Seattle and Vancouver is a great rivalry. I can't imagine that the NHL would – would uh, now we don't know what's going to happen with COVID over the next year or so, but I would think it'd be crazy just to take a natural rival away be, that's so close. But who knows? This is the National Hockey League we're talking about, right? Well, I think it would be worthwhile to make a little roadie down to Seattle uh, to watch the Kraken play when things are uh, back to relative normal. Because I tell you what, there's a lot of buzz down there. I'd like to see some of that firsthand. Now, the interesting thing about Todd is he's a very good friend. He he grew up only a few doors down from Jamie Campbell, who's the host of the Blue Jay broadcast on Sportsnet. And we, we had Jamie on with us on a podcast, and we were talking about a story that had come out in the Globe and Mail, and then it went right across the country, and that was the fact that it might be time for a new stadium. 
Now, Jamie, uh, Jamie touched on that, and also we talked a little bit about the shelf life on stadiums, not only in Major League Baseball, but even for football. You know, it's actually an old story. It's, um, it's something I've known about in bits and pieces for over a year now. And to be honest with you, I love that the Globe and Mail um, released the information and the detail that they have because what it has done is it sparked a lot of enthusiasm among sports fans in this area in particular about the possibility of a new place to play. Um, but it's something that on the ground level and on government levels and as far as I know on uh, Rogers executive levels just hasn't been discussed in quite some time. It was certainly a topic of conversation about 12 to 18 months ago. And there were discussions with the design company and all of that kind of thing. And I even had one person with the organization over a year ago tell me that if they did something, they would try and model it after uh, the St. Louis project of, I think, 2005 or 06, where they literally built the new stadium while they were able to play at Old Bush Stadium. And then once the season ended, they were able to uh, destroy the Old Bush Stadium and finish the one they'd started just outside. And there is a little bit of real estate where the Blue Jays could conceivably do that. But, you know, the pandemic came along and then a number of things happened and they focused all their efforts on playing games in Buffalo. It's just not something that has been on the front burner for some time. And, and maybe the publication of that story will force that now. I don't know. Jamie, that's a relatively short uh, shelf life for a, a facility that costs that much to build. I think it, from 89 till, you know, uh, now, uh, that's not very long. I mean, I think the Kingdome was shorter, but it was a freaking ugly, hideous building the minute it opened. Yeah. Um, why the... And I don't particularly think this facility is 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 tremendous to watch uh, uh, everything in. It, the roof is cool, but why the need to at least explore this option now? What is not there that needs to be there in a new facility uh, to make it make sense? You, you bring up an interesting point, Rob. And if you think about when, for example... Of course, neither one of us was alive at that time. When they when they constructed Yankee Stadium across the river from the Polo Grounds and whatever it was, 1921 or 1922, or, or or built even Dodger Stadium more recently, mm -hmm. uh, and I believe Dodger Stadium is the third oldest stadium in Major League Baseball right now. You know, stadiums then were constructed to last. There was never a thought of um, of demolishing and rebuilding. That wasn't what they were built for. They were built as a long-standing ballpark to house uh, the baseball team of that time. But things changed in the last 30 or 40 years, especially after we saw all those cookie-cutter stadiums like Riverfront in Cincinnati and Three River Stadium in Pittsburgh, um, multifaceted stadiums that could house a baseball team, a football team, an NASL soccer team if you wanted to, multiple concerts whenever they decided to. And then suddenly... A couple of years after the Sky Dome was conceived and constructed, the whole industry changed. And now you've got these retrofit ballparks like Camden Yards, where they really only do have a shelf life of about 30 to 40 years. Because at some point, even Camden Yards is going to have to come down because they just don't have the, uh, the capability of revenue production. Um, that you need to have. Um, and in the case of the Rogers Center, I've been there when they literally postponed a game on a rainy day because there was a leak in the roof. And it's breaking down. Everything breaks down. I'm sure you guys bought a car 10 years ago, and now it's not as attractive as it was when it came off the lot 10 years ago. So, so I firmly believe that the Rogers Center is just near the end of its expiry. And, I mean, they can't just keep sinking money into fixing a roof and fixing everything else when they could spend a whole lot more money um, and go ahead and, and, and make something modern, make something retractable, make something that's going to generate a little more revenue. Um, you know, people may not like the place. 
I didn't like it when it was first built, but I really like it now. Uh, there's there's a history there now. Some great great baseball moments. Joe Carter's home run. Jose Bautista with a bat flip. One of the greatest great cups, if not the greatest great cup, was played there. Yep. Um, but but I think it's time. I honestly think it's time has come, and I think that's the way things are going to go. Think about Atlanta. In the time that the Rogers Center slash Sky Dome has existed, Atlantis had three different places because they played that World Series in 92 at Fulton County Stadium. Right. They built Turner Field for the Olympics, and now they got a brand-new ballpark. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it seems to be the way things are going in professional sports. You, you brought up something that, that I've been thinking a little bit about lately, and that is the NHL released their retro jerseys, and the Oiler one goes back to 1973. So now I'm thinking, okay, so I started watching that team at the old Edmonton Gardens. Then we went to the Coliseum, and now we're obviously at Rogers Place. Did you not like Sky Dome then because you grew up at Exhibition Stadium? You used to go there with your dad all the time. Yep, that's exactly why. And, and Exhibition Stadium, and I don't know if either one of you got there. Yeah, it was a terrible stadium. It was awful. Just as bad for football. But it was, but it was my playground. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, terrible for football. Yeah, not so bad for baseball, but still not great for baseball. It was it was aesthetically unpleasing to look at. It was by the lake, and it was freaking cold there in April and September. I loved the place, like it was my childhood playground. So why on earth would I want to have to take um, an even further go train ride from Oakville to get into Union Station and uh, and walk to? a brand new domed place, which apparently had a retractable roof. Um, I don't know with 25 or 30,000 more customers when I could enjoy the, the sort of the relative um, um, sanctuary of exhibition stadium when they were terrible, nobody went, but I was there and I, and I missed the place. And that's why I didn't like the sky dome when it was built. Now I love the place. It's grown on me. Uh, it's, I have an office there for goodness sake. I spent yeah. most of my life at the center. So I better like it. Um, and I'll like the new place too if they build one, as long as it's uh, you know reasonably comfortable. I'm not sure I want to wear overcoats in April to do a show outside for opening day, but if that's the way it's going to be, then I'll do it. Well, there you go. There's Jamie Campbell from Sportsnet wrapping things up for us on our best of show. As as we've mentioned before, we had a lot of other guests that we just could not get to on this, or we would have been uh, we'd have been stacking them up. This had been a three hour show. But a uh, big thank you to everybody who came on with us and uh, a big thank you to Brent McIntosh and everybody at the McIntosh Group at REMAX River City for joining up with us in October and now have uh, carried through into 2021. So uh, we're looking forward to that. All right. Sum up those six months. Can you do that? Well, I tell you what, uh, I, I loved uh, I loved getting back up and uh, – uh, rolling once you were done slacking off and, and, and taking time away. Yeah. Um, you know what? When I look at that roster of guests, Bryn, uh, I mean, it's blowing our own horn, but I think it was a terrific group. Uh, 2021, hopefully everybody's back up to speed and doing what they do. And, you know, we can match this and add to it. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the new year. Looking back on the old one, uh, this little time that we spend doing this podcast uh, was always a good part of the day, whatever the rest of the day held. Uh, I hope people out there thought the same way and, uh, you know, keep looking for us because we, uh, we strive to get better. It was a lot of fun and hopefully there's more of the same to come. We also have a new email address if you want to drop a comment or two. And the email address is the outsiders at shaw.ca. You can also check us out on Twitter. It's a simple handle, at Outsiders2020. We're not going to change the date. 2020 is going to be it. So make sure you tell your friends and subscribe to our RSS feed. That way, on your favorite ear candy site, when there's a new episode that's dropped, you'll be notified right away. Apple, Google, Spotify, Pocket Casts, et cetera, et cetera. But your support is greatly appreciated. I got to tell you about one email that I got this past week, and I don't have it in front of me, but it's a, a guy who's been listening to our podcast now for quite some time. He says he walks the dog every night. Generally, it's about a half an hour walk, except for Monday. Monday, the walk is an hour. And the reason being, he's listening to our latest podcast every Monday. 
And that's the kind of feedback I love getting. I know you do too. That's good stuff. Oh, absolutely. I mean, so it takes, uh, uh, you know, a regular listener like that. Uh, he takes the dog out. The dog has a crap while he's listening to us. It's perfect, huh? <laughs> okay, now i got an imagery in my head here. Okay, that, well done. Nicely done. Coming up in the new year, who knows what's coming up? All I know is that uh, that's our best of show for 2020. Robin, thanks very much for your time. This has been a blast. You bet, your pal. All right. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year.